right. Well, good morning. Good to see everybody here. We're here to praise God. Uh, we're going to do a couple songs I think everybody knows pretty well, but we're going to get into a new song uh, today called Evidence. You've probably heard it on the radio. Um, but I think it really, if you look at Joseph's life, where Tim is going to be preaching on today, I'm sure there's times that Joseph had to question, God, what are you doing here? I don't understand this, where I'm at. Now, ultimately, he could see the evidence that was there by the time he was uh, second in command of all of Egypt. But there's those times where we're just not sure what God's plan is, or maybe even the timing of God's plan. But when we look back, we're able to see the evidence of that. So when we come to that song, you may not know it well, but really think about Joseph's life and then put that into your own life where things are today and the evidence that you've seen of how good God is and how faithful he is. So let's stand together. We're going to sing together. Glory for our power. 
event we'd like you guys to uh, see over here. You're all's left. Let's partake in this great event with us. There we go. <laughs>
you may have noticed that on TV anymore there are a number of shows about finding treasure. And the people who are looking for the treasure are always positive it's there. They just need to dig a little deeper. Dig in a different spot. They need to have some fancy test done. They need to buy a new piece of equipment. And they just keep repeating that process because they believe it's there. It kind of seems to me like the only people finding the treasure are the ones getting paid for the testing and the expensive equipment. Well, as Christians, we have a different treasure that's available to us. In Ephesians 3, 6 through 8, in the New Living Translation, Paul says, And this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body, and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. So that's the difference between the treasures we have available to us and the treasures of the world. Our treasure in Christ is not hidden in a chest somewhere. It's not buried in the ground. It's not mapped out in some secret code. It's found in Jesus, the Son of God, who came to this earth, who bore our sins on the cross, who died for us, who rose again, and someday will come back for us. That is the greatest treasure of all and the treasure truly worth seeking. Let us pray. Fathers, we come before you at this time in remembrance of your son, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Through his sacrifice, through his conquering of death, through your power, that he will return for us and that one day we will go home and spend eternity with you. Through your son's name we pray. Amen. So as we come to this time of communion, communion is open to all believers. We'll take the outside two sections and have you guys go to the corner tables. In the middle two sections, you'll start here at this uh, middle table, and if you see an opportunity as they get done on the outside, feel free to make your way over to one of those stations. Remember, take, if you receive your emblems, go ahead and take them right there and dispose of the, the cups and the receptacles we have back, back there. While you guys do that, we're going to sing a song that's going to be a, a good lead into the message of this morning. Again, as Tim's talking about Joseph, the song's called Battle Belongs. So anytime during this song, feel free to get up and take communion.
stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power. Well, this morning we're going to continue our series of messages, Is There Life After 2020? And we're going to contend that, yes, there is life. And I want to talk to you about things that might get in the way called detours today. So how do you navigate the detours that are certainly going to come? We've been through some, but moving forward, we'll probably still have to navigate some. You know, I read about a man who was driving out along an old country road, and he came to a, a sign, and it said, Bridge out, roads closed. So he... Uh, well, I don't see it down the road there anywhere. He turned around and retraced his route going to that spot. And as he came back, there's that sign up there. And on the back side of the sign said, it was, wasn't it? So, you know, sometimes we just got to find out for ourselves that uh, there's, there's things that get in our way. And uh, some detours are good and that we, we get navigated to a better spot. Some are just an annoyance and they can cause problems. How do you navigate those detours? Well, that's what we want to look at today, and I think the the, the big idea I want you to get is this. Trusting God is the key to staying on course in life's journey. Now, we've been saying something like this nearly every week. It always comes down to this business called trust. Trusting God is such a big thing. You know, I read read a passage of Scripture uh, the other day that I thought would work in this uh, sermon today, and it's one that a lot of you I know know. You've got it maybe marked in your Bible. And it's out of Proverbs chapter 3, and it begins with verse number 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways submit to Him, and He will make your path straight. Submit to Him, focus on Him, lean into His understanding. He's going to lead you on the right path that you go to, even if you're getting some detours thrown at you in this life. Let God direct your course and make the adjustments. God's ways are always trustworthy. I want to establish that in your mind. It's, they're always trustworthy. 
We may not always see sometimes the wisdom of them. We may not even see exactly the direction we need to go. But if we keep following, it becomes clear. We know that he's always got our backs and he's always out in front to help us. So I would like to look today at four detours and the trust factor that's involved in each one of them. And I want us to learn uh, the lesson of just simply, at times, ruthlessly trusting God. You know, I have a good friend that I uh, saw on a, uh, a Zoom board meeting that we had on Friday at Blessing Ranch. Uh, Gary Cox is his name. He's a pastor of the First Christian Church in Fort Myers, Florida. And he's doing a series of messages right now about navigating setbacks in life. I like the title of the series. Here it is. Setbacks are setups to grow up. I think that's what it comes down to. We, we find these setbacks and we can just let, let them work in our lives to where they set us up so that we can grow up in Christ and step out in the right way. So let's look at four primary detours that we have to not navigate in life and what we do in terms of trusting God. The first one is this, trust God through family problems. Trust God through family problems. Every family's got them, don't they? Well, I heard about an elderly man who had a serious hearing problem for a number of years and his family was trying to convince him to go get your ears tested. So finally he goes to the doctor, gets his ears tested, and the doctor said, yeah, I can put a, a hearing aid in there and nobody's hard, they're not going to know that it's there. I mean, you just can't hardly see it at all. And the guy said, well, that's fine. So he puts the hearing aid in there and he goes home and about a month later he went back to the doctor just for a checkup and the doctor smiled at him and said, you know, your hearing is just about perfect. Your family must really be pleased that you can hear again. And the old man said, oh, I haven't told my family yet. I just sit around and listen to their conversations, and I've changed the will three times. <laughs> now, there's a guy who knew how to understand an adjustment that needed to be made and continues to make adjustments, obviously. You don't have to listen long to know, though, that there are family problems. We just have to admit that. Family problems do happen. Ask Joseph. Now, I could have chosen a number of different characters in the Bible that I could have said, look at how they navigate detours, but Joseph's my favorite. I just think that his, his life and the things he had to navigate, every obstacle that came his way, he just ruthlessly trusted God. And it started with the family problems. You know, the, the issue was really this. Joseph being the youngest, uh, near, next to the youngest at, at this time, he was the youngest, but Joseph um, was the favorite. Now, I have to live with that myself. I've got two older brothers. I'm the youngest of three boys. And they always play the Smothers Brothers thing with me. Dad always loved you best. You know, they give it to me all the time. You were the favorite. You're the favorite and everything. So I, I know it's, a lot of it's tongue-in-cheek, but they don't ever quit saying it. Well, Joseph was his dad's favorite. And to prove it, a special coat was made for him. You know about the story of Joseph. A lot of times they say it was a coat of many colors. And that's not literally it's translated coat of long sleeves. But it was one that would be easily identified in a Jewish family saying, look, this guy is the favored son. No questions about it. So he's wearing that coat very proudly, and he's strutting around his brothers. He's got a bunch of brothers. And he's telling them not only, you know, by the way he's strutting around, I'm dad's favorite, but he's also telling them things about, I've had these dreams, and someday you're all going to bow down to me. He is not putting himself in a very good position with his brothers. And so the brothers don't react well to this. And I can go back to the story out of Genesis Look at chapter, 30, chapter 37 and verse number 4. This is the brother's reaction. When his brothers saw that their father loved him, meaning Joseph, more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. They didn't want to talk to him at all. This is their reaction. And so they looked at every opportunity as a way to get Joseph. How can we get him? So they're out away from the dad one time and they just decide... Let's kill him. Well, a brother stepped up. One of them said, no, 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 no. We can't do that kind of a thing. Like, what? But we can sell him into slavery. Here's a slave trade group coming through here. We'll sell him, and he'll be gone. And we'll go back and tell Dad, you know, we'll put some blood on his coat and things like that, a blood of an animal, and, and we'll just say that he got slaughtered out here someplace, and we'll just let it go. So that's what they do. They, fell, they sell him into slavery. And now he's Egypt-bound. Egypt-bound in a totally foreign land. I would say that's a nasty detour in his life. How about you? Have any sibling rivalries, sibling jealousies, any betrayals, any favoritism you see in your family that you don't like? 
Maybe somebody in the family beat you out of an inheritance. There's lots of things that families have happened to them, and it puts people at odds with one another. What's the answer to that? How do you navigate those kind of things? You trust God to find the way out. You just keep trusting God to find a way out. i got a mess on my hands with my family, but I can get through this. If I keep trusting Him, I'll find an answer somewhere. Somewhere. Joseph did. He hung in there with God, and he watched for God's way out. He went through slavery. He went through imprisonment to a position of power. He became the second most powerful man in his known world. The brothers one day showed up years later because there was a famine all around. They don't know Joseph. They don't recognize him. And they're coming to Egypt because Egypt's the only place that's got food. You wonder what's going to happen when Joseph sees him. He'd have every right to just do away with all of them. Joseph saw things differently. So if you go back to the end of the story in Genesis, Genesis chapter 50, and you look at verses 19 and 20, It says this, this is Joseph's reaction when he saw his brothers and they were fearing for their their lives at that point. He says to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. More than the lives of those brothers, more than the family back home. It was all these people around Egypt, all these different nations were coming there and Joseph had the power to help all of them because Egypt had the food. God saw all that a long time before. Joseph could not have predicted this path for himself, but the detours he had to navigate finally got him to that place where not only was he in a good place, but he helped everybody else to be in a good place. Trusting God's way out is is a result of, of saving lives for many in Joseph's life, and it may be in your life as well. What God is trying to do in your life may have an impact on other people's lives around you. You've got to trust to find God's way out. I read a story years ago about one of the great preachers of our time, Dr. Fred Craddock. He's written books. He's a professor of uh, homiletics, which is the art of teaching uh, the preaching, uh, how young preachers should preach. Craddock tells a story about vacationing with his wife one summer in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And one night they found this little restaurant, and they thought they'd just have a nice, quiet little meal. And while they were waiting for the food, they noticed a distinguished-looking man, white-haired man, moving from table to table, visiting with all the guests. Craddock leaned over and whispered to his wife these words, I hope he doesn't come over here. You see, he didn't want anybody to disrupt their evening, their nice, long, quiet evening and quiet meal. Sure enough, the old white-haired gentleman walked over and he said, Evening, where are you folks from? Craddock said, Well, I'm from Oklahoma. Ah, that's a splendid state, I hear, although I've never been there. What do you do for a living? He said, I teach homiletics at a graduate seminary in Phillips University. Oh, so you teach preachers how to preach. Well, I've got a story for you. And Craddock went, everybody's got a story for a preacher. Everybody does. I guess I'll have to hear one more. So the man stuck out his hand and says, my name is Ben Hooper. Remember that. My name is Ben Hooper. I was born not far from here across the mountains. My mother wasn't married when I was born. So I had a pretty hard time. When I started school, my classmates called me a name that was not a very nice name. I used to go off by myself on recess and and just stay away from all the rest of the kids because they would make fun of me just because I didn't have a dad. And he says that would cut very deeply. What was worse was going to town on Saturday afternoon feeling like every eye was burning a hole through me wondering just who my father was. I knew I was Ben Hooper. But they didn't know who my father was. And in those days, that mattered. When I was 12 years old, he said a new preacher came to our church. And I would always go in late and slip out early. But one day the preacher said after his benediction, and it was said so fast, I couldn't get out that quickly. And so immediately I'm caught up with some other people, adults, and I'm 12 years old. And I'm thinking, I didn't make it out in time today. And then I felt this big hand on my shoulder, and I looked up, and the preacher was looking right at me. And he said, who are you, son? Whose boy are you? He asked. And he said, I felt this big weight coming down on me, and it was like a big black cloud that was descending. Even the preacher was putting me down. But as he looked at me, he studied my face, and then he began to smile, a big smile. It was like a smile of recognition. He says, wait, just wait a minute. 
I know who you are. I see the family resemblance now. You are a child of God. And with that, he slopped me across the rump and said, Boy, you have got a great inheritance. Go and claim it. The old man looked across the table at Fred Craddock and he said, Those were the most important words anybody ever said to me, and I've never forgotten them. With that, he smiled, he shook hands with Craddock and his wife, and he moved on to another table to greet old friends. As he walked away, Craddock, a native Tennessean himself, remembered from his studies of Tennessee history that on two occasions the people of Tennessee had elected to office the office of governor men who had been born out of wedlock. One of them was a man named Ben Hooper. God provided a way out for Ben, and God will always provide a way out. If you've got some family problems going on, God will always provide the way out. You may not see it right away, but if you stay faithful trusting him, he's always got a way out. Well, the second thing is this. Trust God when temptations come. Anybody here been tempted? I think that's a ridiculous question. It's rhetorical. Of course, we've all been tempted, and we're all going to continue to be tempted. Temptations are designed to get you to do something God does not want you to do. They always look good. They always look like something like, you know, I can have fun doing this, or I could, I could say this or say that. Temptations are always designed to look good, but they're not going to be good. There's a story that George Will tells in his book, Men at Work, and it's a book about four prominent baseball players. One of them was named Oral Hershiser, who pitched for the Los Angeles Dodgers a number of years ago. He's in the Hall of Fame. And he says, in, as he's quoting from the book, he says, there are two theories of pitching, Hershiser says. One is that you try to convince the batter that a particular pitch is coming, and then you throw something different. You fool him. He says, the other theory is, and this is the one you don't hardly hear very much about, is that you know what the, pitcher, the batter wants to have. You know his favorite pitch. And you throw it. It's just that you throw it in a place where he can't hit it. He says it's like um, know what a batter wants and expects the, the ball to be in that location when he throws it. But you throw it the same pitch that, you, that he's expecting, but you throw it just a little off, maybe a little higher than normal or a little further outside, and he can't lay off of it. And he swings, and he either hits it poorly or he strikes out. His eagerness will prevent him from laying off the pitch, but he won't hit it very well. You remember in the movie, A League of Their Own, the two sisters are going to play in that league, and the older sister is always telling the younger one, lay off the high ones. She says, I like the high ones. She can't hit them, but she can't lay off of them. And that's the way sin is. That's the way temptation gets you to do things that, I know I shouldn't do it, but I'm going to do it. And you do it. And that's the way the enemy in our lives works. He knows just what kind of pitch that we're a sucker for, and he throws it just enough away or down or whatever it is that when we swing, we do it, it doesn't turn out well. After all, it looks so good, and it feels so right. Isn't that the way temptation is? Well, temptations, though, they're designed to derail you. They're thrown out there as an obstacle in your way. Things are going along pretty well, and all of a sudden something comes along, and you know that eh, I probably shouldn't do it, but you go ahead and do it, because temptations then will get you to do something that will absolutely derail your life. If you buy in, you get hurt. Joseph knew that. When he was in slavery in Egypt, he was spotted by a man named Potiphar, who was this, the commander of the armies of Egypt. Potiphar grew to trust Joseph a lot, trust him with everything in his house. Potiphar oftentimes was out on some campaign, military campaign, and he'd be gone for maybe long stretches of time. And Joseph ran the house. One time, Potiphar's wife approached him. She approached him because, after all, Joseph was, uh, I guess to use the words today, he was a hunk. And so as she approaches him, she's got intentions that she's expressing toward him. And we learn about those in Genesis chapter 39, just the second part, or a third part of verse number 6 and then verse number 7, it says, Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took a notice at Joseph, of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. There's the temptation. You come to bed with me. What's Joseph going to do? Well, he stays on course with God. 
He knows what God would have him do. He understands about the thing called purity, and he wants to stay on course with God, and this woman is a big temptation for him. But look at verse number 9 of that same 39th chapter of Genesis. She makes her play for him, and then he looks at her and says, No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against, you might expect Potiphar, because that's what he's talking about in the context, how could I do such a thing and sin against God? It's always about God. What would he have me do? And he knows I've got to walk away from this situation. And so he flees the situation. He runs from it. He literally runs away without his clothes because she's grabbing at his clothes and pulling them off him as he's trying to get out the door. Things just aren't going well because that's going to end up with her being scorned and she's going to tell her husband about it and it's going to be his fault and Joseph's going to go back to jail. But how do you handle things when temptations come at you really strong like that? Do you run away from the temptation? It's not always easy. I mean, you can talk about in this situation, sex was involved, cheating on taxes could be something, taking advantage of someone else, stealing from somebody or something. You know the right thing to do, but sometimes the temptations are just so strong. And yet, the advice is always stay on course. Joseph ran away and later found God's blessings because he stayed faithful to God. You know, there's a verse of Scripture that has a lot of meaning in my life. Some of you know it's one of my favorites in the Bible. It's over in 1 Corinthians. It's chapter 10, verse number 13. This was something I found when I was going through some struggles where I couldn't say no to some things, and I should have been saying no a lot. Listen to these words. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can endure it. That's the promise from God. No temptation, none can be so strong it can overcome you. If you stay faithful to me, I will find a way out for you. Years ago, I read a thing called uh, the Poss Possibility Thinker's Creed. It's written by a guy named Robert Schuller. Some of you might remember him. And I like what it says. I'm going to kind of paraphrase it a little bit. When faced with a mountain, like a temptation, I will not quit or give in. I will keep striving until, with God's help, I climb over, find a pass through, tunnel underneath, or simply stay and turn the mountain into a gold mine, again, with God's help. Some people use that for just opportunities that have come your way. I say it works with temptation, too. When you're faced with a big temptation like a mountain, God will be faithful to show you the way through or around that situation. Trust God when temptations come. Trust God when you have family problems. And a third thing is, trust God when life is unfair. Have you thought about life being unfair in the last 12 months? I think a lot of people have thought about life being unfair. 2020 was not a good year. We're just glad to get out of that year in a lot of ways. And what's the future look like? Well, there may be more obstacles coming. There may be things that we're going to say, this is just not fair. Have you ever said that? Just cried it out? This is so unfair. Have you cried it out to God? This is so unfair. When someone gets credit for something that you did, for the young guys, when that other guy gets the girl, that's, that's unfair. Somebody gets a promotion that you know was meant for you. Maybe a loved one dies. Or maybe, as I was talking to one of our teachers, maybe you're told you've got to teach history a different way other than the truth. And it might be something that's very simple. For me, in the last 10 months, when they close the restaurants. You don't do that to a guy called the food magnet in this church. And so we go to those restaurants and find that they were absolutely closed or 25%, and guess what? You're not in that 25% right now. I'm just teasing. Unfair? There's lots of things that are unfair. They're detours. Let me say it this way. Some detours, detours are more than just annoying, aren't they? They're more than just kind of get under your skin a little bit. They really get into you deep. Unfair. And then sometimes when it's unfair, you're not certain where to go with things in the future. Look at Joseph's detours. Slavery, 
imprisonment. And on one occasion, he helped out a prisoner, a fellow prisoner. The guy couldn't interpret his dream, and Joseph interpreted his dream, and things were going to turn out really well for this guy, and he was going to be there serving the, the, the great ruler, the, the, the Pharaoh. And all Joseph asked was, when that time comes, would you remember me back in jail and I helped you out? And the guy forgot about him, forgot that he lived. Unfair? How do you think Joseph felt? I think we get an idea about that when he's always trying to do the right thing. But over in the book of, of uh, Psalms, Psalm 11, it's a Psalm of David who had a lot of things that didn't, they were detours, things that were unfair in his life. And look at what he says. Psalm 11, verses 2 and 3. For look, the wicked bend their bows, they set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. That's a graphic imagery. When foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? When life is unfair and things just seem like they're going against you, people are all against you, what can the righteous do? We've all felt that way. God seems so distant at times when detour, detours show up. Life can be unfair and very uncertain. But here's what I would encourage you to do. Remember that God is with you. It's not just trust in God, but remember always that God is with you. Joseph always remembered this. That's why he could always choose to do the right thing, because he knew what God wanted him to do, and he knew God was with him in that situation. Going back to the, or look at uh, Joseph's life back in Genesis, when I get to uh, Genesis chapter 39, verses 20 and 21, Joseph was in prison. It says, but while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. And that would pay big dividends later on. But God was always placing somebody in his path, changing, altering the circumstances where Joseph could just keep following, even though the detour was there, but he knew he was going to get around it because God's always present. In the funerals that I do, funeral services I do, I usually include this, even for Christian funerals. I will say... You're going to find encouragement by remembering this person who's passed out of your life. It's, it's a sad occasion today, but you're going to have memories that are so powerful, ways in which your life was blessed. That brings comfort to you, but the greatest comfort of all comes from God, the one who gives us life, sustains our lives, and to one, the one to whom we can go for eternity. And on today, you might be asking that question, where is he? I don't see him. And I'll tell him, you can't see God like you and I are looking at each other right now. I can assure you that he's here. It's not that you see him, but you come to trust that he will show up and you feel the effects of that. So trust that he's here today. You will know that he's with you. You will feel the effects of peace and comfort that will come your way. I think Joseph never lost sight of that, that God was always with him, directing him. And I want you to remember these words. I will be with you always, even until the end of of the age. You know who said those? That's right, a lot of you said it. Jesus said those. You know when he said them? He was getting ready to ascend into heaven. He says those parting words to his disciples, I will be with you always as they're watching disappear into the heavens. How's that work? You feel his power. You feel his presence. You feel the comfort, the peace, the direction. He's always going to show up even if you don't see him. During World War II, a passenger ship was going to set sail from Great Britain and it was headed for New York City. And the captain of the ship was very afraid of the enemy vessels. The Germans had lots of U-boats uh, out in there, you know, the little submarines, and they also had some destroyers out there on the ocean, and they were shooting anything that looked like an enemy to them. So he calls the British admiral, and he asks him, what do I do? And the admiral calmly assures him, he says, when you can run into a situation like that, you see one of those guys, don't take any detours. Sail the, strip, the, the ship straight ahead. Continue onward, heading towards the intended mark. Do not take any detours. So after sailing several days on the Atlantic, the under, it was going to happen. You just knew it was. The enemy ships appeared. And the captain spotted this destroyer off his forward bow. And nervously, he grasped the handset, and he called for some help, just some reassurance. He said, what am I going to do? They're sitting right over here. And a voice from below said, Keep on straight. Isn't that what the admiral said? Do not detour. Just sail the straight as a ship straight ahead. Everything will be just fine. Just keep going straight ahead. And he did. 
And after a couple more days, the ship safely pulled into the Great Harbor at New York City. Shortly after docking, the great battleship, Man of War, pulled into the port right behind that passenger vessel. And the captain realized that while he did not see the British battleship, she was there all the time, standing by, standing ready to come to his defense, should it prove necessary. And isn't that the way God operates? Sometimes we just look around, where is he? And we certainly can't see him like we see each other. But God is in that situation. When it's unfair, believe God knows it's unfair. And he's in there to help you get through that time. Trust in God. When life is unfair and seems so uncertain, trust in God when temptations come. Trust in God when family problems are upon you. And the last thing I would say is this. Trust God in the shadow of death. Yes, even in this COVID thing, some of you in this room had to experience that in your own family. Someone that you loved had this COVID and they died as a result. That's a shadow of death that comes into your life. What do you do with that? You trust God when the shadow of death shows up. Here's what I've learned about death. Death's certainty produces God's direction. I've seen it in people's lives. Just the certainty of death, if they really look at God, he will show you the direction you need to go. You'll get the comfort that you intend to get. Joseph was taught this by his father. If I go back to Genesis again, you go into the 48th chapter, verse number 21, Joseph's father, he meets up with him again. It's a great reunion, but then his father's very old and he's getting ready to die. And it says in verse 21 of Genesis 48, Israel said to Joseph, I'm about to die, but God will be with you and take you back to the land of your fathers. Going back to the promised land. And that was, we find out later, that's a prophecy that was going to be fulfilled 400 years later when the Hebrew nation left Egypt and went to the promised land that God was giving to them. God moves us forward even though death's shadow is right there. David had to teach his brothers that as well. You go to the very last chapter, the 50th chapter, Joseph's older now. It's time to go home. And he says to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Things will get worse for the Israelites in Egypt. They will become slaves. And they think they'll be trapped there forever. Death is all around them constantly, but God will bring them out of that situation to the promised land. That's what the book of Exodus is all about. God's certainty produces God's direction every time. You've got to realize this. God will be in that valley. When you're in that valley, God will be with you. Now, you've got to understand this. It's not just when you're actually absolutely in the valley of the shadow of death. When you're dying yourself, it's more than that. Every time somebody that we know is experienced this, they know they're very close to death, we're in that shadow, and it affects you in lots of different ways. And what do you do in those situations? Well, I always go back to that really great passage of Scripture. It's over in Psalm 23. You know it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not have any needs because he's with me all the way. But I want to focus just on a couple other verses, though, verses 4 through 6 in Psalm 23 where it says, even though I walk through the valley of the the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God's goodness and love will follow you all the days of your life. He's always out in front. He's always helping to direct your life. You can be assured of that. And someday we will cross over into that new land. Someday we'll receive that healing oil that's intended to be an image, imagery of not just temporary healing, but permanent healing, where there's no more pain, there's no more sorrow, there's no more death. All of that is gone. And we have that assurance to live by that until someday we dwell in the house of the Lord. You all know that I was very close with my mama. You also know that about the last words she said to me, was simply good night, the night before she passed away. She said that in response to me because I figured I'd see her the next day, so I just said, goodbye, Mama. I was getting ready to go. I gave her a kiss on the cheek, and she was shaking her head, and I looked at her, and she says, no, good night, good night. 
as if she was just going home and I'll see you tomorrow. In reality, that is true. I will see her tomorrow, the way eternity counts it. I will see her on that great getting up morning that's yet to come. And so, as Bill Gaither wrote in that great song, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. That's unconditional. No matter what detours you have, no matter what problems you face, because he lives, you have a tomorrow until that day when we stand before him in eternity. So here's the final thought for you, my conclusion. You can trust God for the best directions around life's detours. They're going to come again. 2020 had a bunch of them. 2021 will have some too. But you can trust that God will get you through all that as you keep focused on him. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this opportunity we've had to look into your word again. As we looked at the subject of what do we do when life throws detours at us, we simply keep trusting you. We find answers for the detours that we go through in your word. Sometimes it comes by the word as uh, it's told to us by a brother or sister in Christ. Circumstances sometimes will point us in that direction, always knowing that, Father, you're working through a variety of different levels and ways just to get us around that detour. So, Father, whatever anyone in this room is going through today, Father, I pray that you'll be close to their hearts. And may they look at you with the eyes of faith that say, I trust you. It's not just what I believe, but I do trust you, Father, that you will get me through what I need to go through. Father, I thank you for the opportunity we have to be your, called your children and to know that you take that seriously. You love us all with a passion that is great. And so, Father, I pray for each person in this room today, no matter what they might be going through, give them the direction they need. Let them feel your presence, your comfort, and your peace. And we thank you for leading us every step of the way until we're home. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as we come to the end of the service today, you may be thinking about a decision or two in your own life. Maybe it's a decision of, uh, you just saw earlier in the service today, one of our young girls uh, was making that decision to accept Christ as her Lord and Savior, to be united with him in baptism. And so if you're thinking about that, want to uh, talk about that a little bit, we'll be glad to talk with you. Also, uh, maybe you're looking at this church and saying, I'd like to find out more about the church. Maybe I'd like to be a part of this church family. We'd be glad to talk with you about that. Or you might be facing a detour in your life right now, a detour, and you're not quite sure what to do with it. We would love to pray with you about that. Now, I'm going to ask any of the elders that are in the room right now, would you raise your, raise your hand? There's one over here. That might be. He and I might. Oh, there's one in the very back over there. Ben's over there. So you've got two elders right there. Avail yourself of, the, of those men. They will be glad to help you. Uh, if you want to just ask any questions, if you want some prayer, they'll be glad to talk with you about that. And, of course, you know the invitation is open anytime. You can call the church or you can write us a little note and drop it off in the box outside the office. We'll check that and we'll get in touch with you. So uh, we're just wanting to be available to help you in any situation you're in right now today, okay? All right, I think we're about to the end of the service, and one other thing, you got that little half sheet that you picked up when you came in, it kind of tells you about things going on uh, in the life of the church this week. One of the things we want to remind you about, though, is at the bottom of that are some good things about making up your taxes this year. We don't always hear good news, but there's something there that you need to read uh, that uh, has to do with filling out your taxes this year. There'll be a benefit to you. So you can check that out. If you have any questions about it, you can call us or the person who prepares your taxes, uh, if it's not you, uh, and be glad to help you out because you, you do get some benefit directly from 2020. All right? So those are just some things for you to think about. Hey, it's great to see each and every one of you. I know it's not the best day outside, but it is the day that the Lord has made, so rejoice and be glad in it, will you? Let's be standing at this time for a benediction. Go in the grace and the peace and the direction of God who is always out in front. Trust him with anything that comes into your life, any detour that life presents to you. He'll get you through it, around it, over it. Somehow, he'll bring you to the other side. Have a great week. We'll